Good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting on May 13th, 2019 of the Board of Education for Dearborn Public Schools. Roll call, please. Hussein Berry. Here. Mary Lane. Here. Roxanne McDonald. Here. Michael Mead. Here. Adam Ozip. Here. James Thorpe. Present. And President Petlichkoff. Here. Next, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, Dr. Joshua Tynan, Principal of Nolan Elementary School, will introduce students who will lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone, please stand. Good evening. I'm actually going to let Ms. Folletti, our third grade teacher, introduce her students. Hello, everyone. These are my third grade students, Colin, Alyssa, and Olivia, who will lead us in the pledge. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And you are Olivia. Thank you so much. Good job. All right, then. Thank you, students. Next item, please. New board member, oath of office. Board member Adam Mosip will take the oath of office at this time, administered by Susan DeBaja, City Council President. Susan DeBaja and Adam Mosip will stand and with right hands raised. Ms. DeBaja will ask him to repeat after her the following oath of office. Good evening, trustees. Good evening. Good evening. Trustee Mosip, please raise your right hand. And I'll go slow. Okay. All right. Repeat after me. I do hereby swear and affirm. I do hereby swear and affirm. I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. And the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And that I will faithfully discharge. And I will faithfully discharge. The duties of the Office of Trustee of the School District of the City of Dearborn. The duties of the trust. Office of the Trustee. Office of the Trustee of the City District of Dearborn. Of the School District of Dearborn. School District of Dearborn. And to the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. In the manner provided by law. In the manner provided by law. Congratulations. Congratulations, Trustee Mosip. Just, just for everyone's um, edification here, uh, Trustee Mosip, this is his second ceremonial swearing in, and he, it's actually his third oath because he's required by law to take it 10 days after we appointed him. So he, he is duly sworn in at every level. Thank you. Uh, can I say a few words? Uh, Certainly. President, thank you. I'm truly honored and humbled to join the Board of Trustees to serve our students our parents and uh, our teachers and staff. Uh, this has been a journey for me and I'm, I'm truly honored again. I'd like to thank uh, our amazing council president, Susan DeBaja, for administrating the oath. I'd like to also thank my wife who's here with me. Uh, thank you for being with me all this time and bearing with me. So I'm really excited uh, to work with you and my colleagues to advance our schools and uh, to make sure that we are putting students first and we're building on the successes that we've had. So thank you so much for this honor again. Thanks. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. Mary. 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 I just wanted to say that uh, this past month I've been uh, very, not surprised, but very impressed with Trustee Mozib. Uh, he hit the ground running. You know, thank you for that. So if you're a supporter of Trustee Mozib or don't know him, get to know him. Uh, 
I, I feel that you'll be confident that he'll be serving our district and our students to the best of his ability. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, thank you. Next item, please. Superintendent's update, agenda items. So first, just wanted to uh, start with, um, we're gonna, we have a couple, passing of a couple of uh, good friends to Dearborn Schools. Uh, first, I just wanna mention uh, uh, Mr. Russ Gibb. Uh, Mr. Gibb was instrumental in the ongoing success of the video program over at Dearborn High. For more than 25 years, he taught hundreds of students, many going on to achieve great success in all areas of video, television, motion pictures, advertising, and other fields related to multimedia production. Um, however, Mr. Gibbs' real legacy was his ability to connect with students of all backgrounds and abilities. He was an advocate for children and always acted in the best interest of students. Mr. Gibb was a teacher, but he was also a motivator and ment mentor to all that passed through his classroom. Um, in April of 2017, um, the board uh, approved naming the Dearborn High video program um, after uh, Mr. Gibb, and I think we'll all remember that presentation where the power went out halfway through the, <laughs> the presentation uh, during those electrical storms. So we have Mr. Gibb, and then the, we also learned of, um, you know, the passing of uh, Pam Adams, uh, former trustee, uh, served on the board from, uh, from 96 to 2014. Uh, when she decided not to re run for re-election, she was dealing with some health concerns. Um, she was actually at my uh, event at the uh, Renaissance Center mm -hmm. for my award with the state when I gave that address back in February. Uh, she was part of the board uh, that developed a successful uh, 2002 bond that brought four new schools to the district as well as the 2013 SMART bond. Uh, both of these have helped to serve the needs of the students while uh, being fiscally responsible to the community. During her 19 years on the board, she also served during the expansion of the bilingual uh, program, district-wide boundary line changes, creation and expansion of state-funded uh, preschool, and the creation of collegi the Collegiate Academy. Um, and I know that arrangements are being made for um, her memorial that's coming up. So I'd like us to observe uh, a mo moment of silence uh, for the passing of both of these individuals, please. Thank you. Yes, Trustee Barry. Uh, regarding former uh, trustee Pamela Adams, God bless her soul. When I first came on the board, uh, didn't know didn't know her that well, but it didn't take me long to learn that uh, she, what was in her heart, what was in the best interest of this district and the students. Uh, she loved our teachers. She loved the PTA. She was a big advocate for our students. Uh, uh, in 2014, when uh, Pam first became ill, uh, I was chairing the board then, I heard that she wanted to resign. And I know Trustee McDonald and I visited her and I said, if you put in your resignation, we're not gonna accept it. We'll figure something out. And we did, the board did figure out that we let her finish out her term and through phone calls. Through Skyping, phone, yeah, yeah, through Skyping and phone calls. So she served us for, I believe, 22 years, what was said? No, nine, 18 to 19 She served us for almost two years, decades. Yeah, almost uh, two decades. Uh, you know, I was honored to serve with her. Pam, we miss you, and we will always think of you with these meetings. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, Trustee Lane. Yeah, I'd like to say also I uh, worked many years with Pam. I mean, I during uh, most of my tenure on the board. And uh, when I first won election, uh, I, I made a statement to the press uh, saying that I thought the board was acting in a stodgy manner. They were stodgy or and uh, she yet and she she told me later that she didn't like the comment. Uh, she was very honest about it, but she was the first person to reach out and contact me. Mm -hmm. um, almost everyone who served with her will have seen her at some point or another tear up and get emotional. Um, you know, during so many emotional times in our district when uh, 9-11, I mean, um, and passing of so many people uh, along the way, our journeys through life, we have people come, we have people go, and Pam was always here with a tear in her eye. Uh, not that she wasn't thinking, but just that she had a great heart, and she had a great heart for the students generally. She worked tirelessly as a PTA leader, mm -hmm. and individually she was a warm and caring person, so... I will miss her very much also. But uh, Dr. Maliko, I think they have set a, memor a memorial service for May 30th at 4 o'clock, and I believe it's at Park Place. Okay. 
Yes. So they they would um, the family would like if anyone is interested to um, visit the How Peterson the Dearborn How Peterson uh, website to um, they have an e bite there so that they can. Um, know how many individuals they may um, be anticipating attending the memorial service on May 30th. <clears throat> so if you're interested and want to RSVP, that would be very helpful. They, they, the daughters have um, contacted uh, some of us and let us know that that's how they would like to handle the memorial. Um, I knew Pam first through the PTA uh, and um, then as a board member and uh, she was a great friend. I was in contact with her um, all, all this time. And uh, while she struggled with her health in these last few years, she was still very much interested in what was um, happening in the district. And Pam used to always say, if you are making your decision on, in the best interest of the students, then uh, you're not going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, Pam was extremely emotional. She, she would tear up very easily, but uh, she uh, always uh, was quick to um, let you know where she stood. And um, I, I missed her the moment I heard um, of her passing, and it's, it's, I, I would call her regularly um, to discuss my, my worries and concerns, um, even to this day, uh, to make sure that I wasn't missing something in my uh, thought processes. So uh, I, I really um, enjoyed the conversations that we had. Uh, unfortunately, she uh, didn't win this last fight that she had, uh, but I'm sure she's going to be uh, looking down on us and uh, directing something up there. Hopefully it'll be positive and maybe the sun will come out. <laughs> So uh, I'm sure we'll all miss her. Yes, Roxanne. I just want to add a couple of things to what's been said. Um, when I first came on the board, I did know Pam from PTA and, and prior, but when I first came on the board, she was the very first person to call me and ask me to meet with her. And we did, and um, she gave me her point of view on a lot of things and kind of said, you know, this is you shouldn't do this, and this is what you should do, and that kind of thing. And I, I soaked it all up. But just in general, she was a wonderful mentor. And took me under, my, under her wing. She answered my questions. She helped guide me when I was not sure about how to handle things. And uh, the whole community has just suffered so many great losses in the last few months. So just just think about the, the wonderful legacy that a lot of people have left on. A, lot of, a lot of leadership, a lot of institutional knowledge. That absolutely. Has, um, and they will truly be missed. Yes. Absolutely. And one other thing, just because she did that with me, I've tried to do the other, the same thing, because it was valuable for me to new board members as they come on, meet with them and kind of Absolutely. answer the questions, guide them a little bit, help them out. Because you have no idea what the job entails until you're actually here. And everybody can always have a, 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 a different a, 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 and and a need to um, have a sounding board. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. Always. All right, then. Thank you. Uh, next item. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have um, Zainab and uh, Ibrahim are going to uh, speak to the uh, retirements. We're giving them some duties uh, as their role. We're glad to have them here and very excited. So we'll ask them to come up to the Oh, podium. I thought you meant they were retiring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said that was a and short. Like <laughs> I'll just mention that May and June are the, the months that we get larger lists of retirements. And so we want to congratulate all our retirees. So we're going to recognize them now. Suzanne Addison, three, over three years of service. Mary, Maria Ajami, over 21 years of service. Kimberly Bodkin, over 18 years of service. Lori Bush, over 30 years of service. Linda Sasadi, over 20 years of service. Joseph Cook, 23 years of service. Khalil Dukhlala, over 34 years of service. Theresa Dawikalo, over 21 years of service. Allison Dumke, 23 years of service. Ibrahim Elzair, 33 years of service. Liana Fassen, over 13 years of service. Heather Ferris, 24 years of service. Nadra Lombardi, over 20 years of service. John Lenders, 25 years of service. Carlene McBain, 
30 years of service. Naima Maslamani, over 24 years of service. Bruce Pantaleo, 30 years of service. Brian Taylor, 25 years of service. Pamela Woods, over 14 years of service. Kathy Yankara, over 32 years of service. Muhammad T. Bazi, over 11 and a half years of service. Virginia Lingefilter, uh, 20, over 26 years of service. The following donation has been offered to the school district. Acceptance of this donation is requested at this time. A donation of $1,625 has been offered to Dearborn High School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for BPA registration fees. A donation of $1,000 has been offered to Dearborn High School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for newspaper equipment. A donation of $3,099.80 has been offered to Woodworth Middle School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for TI-inspired calculators. A donation of $506 has been offered to Salina Elementary School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for books. A donation of $1,000 has been offered to Stout Middle School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for music books. A donation of $1,200 has been offered to Salina Intermediate School by the ICD and CRSD to be used for PBIS. A donation of $200 has been offered to Salina Intermediate by Paramount Title Agency to be used for the 4th grade Garden Club. A donation of $4,554.91 has been offered to Edsel Ford High School by Westbourne Chrysler to be used for automotive parts that will be used for lab activities and visual aids. A donation of two iPads has been offered to Nowlin Elementary School by Jasmine's Voice to be used as communication tools for students with autism. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next. Non-agenda non items. Okay, so um, we have some extra things that were added for this month because last month, if you recall, we had um, the board appointment process that we need to use the meeting. And so my apologies, I added all of this to the agenda tonight, so it's a little bit heavy. So our presenters are going to, a lot of this is responses to the board on things that have come up, but we're going to ask our presenters during the commentary to try to be, you know, brief, get to the point, and if there's questions, of course, the board is welcome. So we're going to have Mark Andrews come up right now uh, about Trinity response on some of the routes. Good evening, trustees. As Dr. Malika just mentioned, I'll try to be quick, but I wanted to try to put in context some of the information that was passed along in regards to some of the troubles that our families were having with the Trinity Transportation Group. So with that information, real quick though, um, they provide 20, they perform 23 routes for us. So the information that we pass along, they divide that up into two terminals. They have 18 routes that come out of the Detroit West Terminal, and they have five that come out of their Wyandotte Terminal. So the information that we pass along was just out of the Detroit West Terminal, because that's where we were experiencing most of the troubles. So I just wanted to clarify that real quick. So looking at that information, uh, when we go back and look at uh, each month as a snapshot, so in January, out of the 18 routes, they had, we had 15 days that school was open, so they had 72 buses that were late during that month. So before I sent the information along, I kind of tweaked it a little bit. So I highlighted the yellow days or the times that they were late, and then I boldened them if they were over, if they were 15 minutes late. And then I put in red bold if they were 30 minutes or later, because in our industry, if it's 30 minutes or later, that's really considered a service failure. You know, anything under 15 minutes, as long as the, depending on the frequency, that might not be their fault if it's under 10, 15 minutes, but around 15 minutes and above, that's when we start looking at, at the, the transportation providers and seeing if it's their fault. So going back to January, they had 72 late buses and five of those were 30 minutes or later. So and when you look at it in retrospect, that's 25% of the routes that ran late that month. So when you look at February, uh, they got a little bit worse. They had 95 late buses, and 11 of those were 30 minutes or later. And that ran about 30% of the routes ran late that month. Now, in that transition in February, because we were working with the Trinity Group, they brought in uh, a new area manager uh, to the Detroit West Terminal. And that's when we started seeing things improve. 
So going into March, they had 74 late buses, which translated to about 20% of their routes ran late. But I'd like to point out, they had zero routes that ran 30 minutes or later that month. And if you look at the data, almost all of them were five minutes or less. So that's it. And then I can tell you from just the volume, we don't have the data for April yet. Um, but the volume from our office, I can tell you, almost nil to nothing, any calls that we got from our families or the schools. All right, Trustee Barry, I'll, I'll, I'll let the trustees go first. I guess ultimately, we don't want to use an outside vendor. An outside vendor. I mean, that's our ultimate goal. Uh, but with Trinity, are we under contract with them for a certain amount of years? It expires. We're right now looking at putting out a bid because their current contract ex uh, expires July 1st. July 1st. Okay, yep. that answers my other question. Okay, thank yep. you. I, too, would rather not do any uh, outside vendors in this area, but I understand the need for it. Um, I'm glad things are improving because I had, had several parents call me and say, you know, this is an issue, especially with st uh, special needs students right. because they need regiment. And sometimes if things are not regimented, if they're expecting something and it doesn't happen, they just can spin out. And, yeah. and it's hard to get them back. Yeah. Um, so uh, more than anything, I wanted to bring this issue to your attention just so people are aware of it, that you uh, give us the information, look at it, and, and try to correct the situation because it was getting a little out of hand. I'm glad things are getting better. Um, and I, I'm curious because there were some, and I've been told it's hard to track, um, but the frequency of like particular uh, households, they're being late consistently. And then some of them that were 30 minutes late, some of them never even showed up. But the parents don't get any contact or, or sometimes don't get contact. And that, that and was one of the, in February when we were working with the Trinity group. Okay. At that time, most of their office staff came up through the ranks as a driver. Okay. So when they were short drivers, their office staff were all going out on the road. So when we brought that to their attention that the communication was failing, okay. that's when they hired on some permanent office staff and that's where the communication improved from their office. Okay. Um, as long as we are contracting a service, I want to make sure that we get our money's worth because it reflects bad on us when they don't do a good job. Absolutely. So that was my chief concern. Yeah. But Trusty. I'm glad it's been addressed. Trustee Moser. I, I do agree with Trustee McDonald. I mean, um, a parent would not know if they're Trinity or Dearborn Public exactly. Schools. They are just... Dearborn Public Schools or representing us. My question is, do is there any penalties in the contract if they're late this many times? Did we anticipate that? Our current contract doesn't have any penalties other than we're looking at putting it out for bid and we'll take bids from other from other. And I think vendors. that would be a good point for the next contract is to make sure that, you know, if this were to happen again that there would be some consequences and we're not just passing the puck. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Trustee how long does the contract usually run for transportation? Is this a situation where maybe they're just on their best behavior knowing it's coming up for renewal and then if we do a long term, it could go right back to where it was? That's a good question. I, I don't believe that it was because of the length of the contract. But with that being said, what we're looking at right now is doing a one-year contract with the option of renewal for two more years. Okay. So it's not guaranteed for three years, but the option's there if things are going well. Thank you. Okay, now I ask my questions. <laughs> uh, number one, w would, it, would it be fair to say that potentially some of the issues with the lateness might be seen with our own bus services when it comes to um, traffic conditions and or students um, getting students on and off the bus and how the length of time it right. takes to move the students on and off the bus I'm going to assume especially if it's like five minutes or absolutely 15. so that's why I bolden the ones that were 15 minutes or later because not for not a hundred percent of the time but usually under 15 minutes it usually isn't you know, the bus's problem or fault at it being late. It could be traffic, it could be weather, it could be because they're being a little bit more patient with, because these all are special ed right. uh, 
families that they're providing services for. So we don't want them to be rigid and say, you know, one minute, two minutes, that's it. It's kind of a flowing, you know, if it's day by day, but now if it becomes a habit where we're waiting five or 10 minutes, then we'll, and our special ed department is great. We'll go to them and say, we need to get some help with this student. You know, they're, they're taking some time. The, right, exactly. Right. Get on because the bus. I, because I have, I have a special needs student on my block and I see the amount of time it takes mm -hmm. yeah. sometimes for them to come out of the house or to get the student off. And once you back it up at one, stopping point it's going to be backed up but that is a fair assumption as so, long as yeah, i mentioned right. the frequency isn't there we'll look at the frequency if it's late 10 minutes every day then maybe there is something there in the bus route that we can adjust but every now and then if the one route is 15 minutes or less late that very well could be because of traffic or because of other circumstances okay now so the, then this goes to my next question uh, because we're going to put out a bid and i don't know what the uh how we can vet any of these companies that we're going to have to rely on right now to not have a similar problem with them. What else can we do with the contract in order to try to um, mitigate those, these kinds of situations so that we don't just transfer the problem to another company? Right. That, that's great. I'll get with Mike, you know, our purchasing director, and we'll try to work that out in the contract before we, before yeah, we put it out. If there's something we can, we can adjust um to to try to help offset that right. would be great yeah we could look at other contracts right to see yeah you can do that of other districts i mean oh uh, right i i guess you would see have to, you'd have to see what other districts say about the service that they're getting trustee lane uh mr andrews i from what i've seen uh, what i've read uh you've brought a fresh customer service orientation to transportation and i appreciate that oh you're welcome Yes. I'm happy you noticed that because it was one of my goals. Well, we picked the right man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to keep moving this along. Uh, David Shannon and I believe Dr. Ball are just going to briefly speak to the building use um, fields and things during off seasons. And so. The uh, initial question uh, that was asked by the board was what is our policy on facility use? I think this statement pretty much sums up the overall attitude and in, in our outlook toward, toward facility use is that we want to make it use, you know, our facilities available to the public as much as possible. Uh, of course, there's always that balance between uh, interfering with or taking up resources from the original intent, which is for our students. And then also, we do have neighborhood schools, which means that we are part of a neighborhood. And like any good neighbor, you want to cooperate with your neighbors and you want to get along with your neighbors. Uh, and at the same time, if there, are, um, if there are any concerns or problems going on, you want to address those so that you are a good neighbor. Um, as far as our facility, the, uh, facility use with rentals, um, our buildings are used all the time. Um, they are constantly being rented. Uh, a lot of it is recreation uh, use by the city for programs such as basketball, swimming, baseball, and a number of other football, number of other programs as well. But beyond that, we have many, many other community groups who use our facilities for um, a variety of activities, including um, uh, running schools, um, running, uh, we have two different Arabic schools that run in our schools on the weekends. This part of the uh, web page um, really shows uh, the easy way where people can just access um, if they're interested in renting facilities. They have to sign up to become a community user. It's a very simple form. Our adult and community education program kind of facilitates the rental process. And this is the, this is the, the portal where you start that process at. So that's the official kind of technical side of things. Then there's just the common everyday use, and that kind of falls in that area of we are good neighbors. So our playgrounds are used by people in the neighborhood. Kids are out there, they use the playground equipment after school and on the weekends. They use the uh, tracks for walking, many, not just kids, but adults are doing that as well. Our past history, um, this has worked out very well. We've had really, this has been a good, good kind of partnership and relationship with the neighbors in, our, in and around our schools. 
And probably the only area that we've run into some difficulties is where some people have abused those facilities. So we have had adults come in and use the basketball courts that are outside, and they've used them late at night. Um, they've used them to the point where they've created some damage. And more importantly, they've used them to the point that they have disrupted neighbors by the schools. And neighbors who live by schools, they expect a certain amount of activity around the school after school and on the weekends, and are usually pretty flexible about that. But when the problem becomes, you know, people there at 10, 11, midnight, using the basketball facilities, um, creating a disturbance, and then, like I said, even vandalizing the facilities, that's where there's been a problem. And that's where we've allowed individual schools to use their discretion. So we don't want to have a blanket policy that says every basketball court is going to be closed at 9, 9 p.m. That would be fair to those schools where that's going on and there's no problems. But where there has been issues in the past, we've allowed those schools, those principals and those engineers to resolve those problems um, by either removing the, the rims over the summertime uh, or um, making some other accommodations to limit the use. So, so that's kind of where we are with that. I think um, Mr. Mustin uncovered it all. So I did get complaints this year from a neighbor of one of our schools, and his complaint was at 2 a.m., people playing basketball, um, using their car to light up the court, the language, the paraphernalia that was left, and I did recommend to the principal that at the end of the school year that the, the nets come down so that he doesn't, you know, so that the neighbors aren't dealing with that all summer long in, in the middle of the evening or in the middle of the night, because I don't know about you, but at 2 a.m. I'm in bed. Um, as a principal, when I was a principal, there I would always leave one night where I would not approve permits so that I could host parent nights and, and honors nights and different activities for the school. So I had one night that, that we could do all those sorts of things. So lots of different things go into approving or, or not. It, but it is important that if we have community groups using the facilities that they are filling out a permit, even if it's for outside, because sometimes I would have kids leaving from a school um, activity and cars whipping through the parking lot, and if they didn't have a permit for the <coughs> field, then I didn't know who to contact to talk to about the possibility of putting students in danger. So um, we have a process. I think we're, we, we wouldn't take... <coughs> We wouldn't take basketball nets down unless there was a reason to, because we do have, I live in the community, community schools, but there are some reasons where it, it just makes sense. Are the, yes, Trustee Bear. I know you're just delivering a message here, but when you say late at night and at 2 a.m., I mean, where does the police, when does the police get involved in something like that? I mean, I know they're posted. Yeah, the recommendation is, have you called the police? I have. It continues, and it hasn't stopped. So, so with, with our neighborhood schools, mostly elementaries, uh, there's usually that one neighbor that is going to call you, and they're going to call the administration, and they're going to call the board president and complain and complain and complain. Uh, if, it's, if somebody's abusing our facilities, mm -hmm. they need to be prosecuted. If somebody is there after, I guess it's, I believe it's 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. Right. Whatever the curfew is. Whatever the curfew is in the area, yeah. I mean, they're trespassing. Those need to be dealt with. Uh, it just, I, I truly don't believe it's fair that you drive by some of these schools and, you know, and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the facilities, you know, you got the nice flowers out there and the kids are playing basketball and there's parents walking with their kids around the track. Then you walk, you drive by another school, and you know, with all the respect, I won't even use that term. It just doesn't look good. It just doesn't look good. The rims are down. Uh, nobody's there. It's like vacated. I mean, what's the, what is it? I mean, if we have, I don't know, about twenty some elementaries. Uh, I know with uh, the current uh, financial situation we're going with the city, they're closing pools, they're closing, you know, the parks, parks, the whole nine yards. And if the facilities are there and it's, they actually belong to the taxpayers, uh, I think we should have, like, you know, yeah, the principal needs to monitor it, 
but we should have a uniform policy for, for, for every building. I don't think it's fair if I live in a certain part of the community that just that one neighbor that, you know, that school was there 50 years before you moved into the neighborhood. You know, that's wrong. You know, if somebody's just, just because they're complaining for whatever reason. Don't get me wrong. If somebody's there on our property trespassing, prosecute, prosecute, prosecute. If somebody's there at 2 o'clock in the morning, I think they, I won't say what we need to do, but uh, okay, I think you get my message. I'm just going to speak at, um, I'm going to wear a completely different hat. I'm president of the Federation of Neighborhood Associations, and I've heard the complaints from neighborhoods, and it's not just one person usually. It's the whole role of um, homeowners who are backed up to certain properties. It's not all of the schools that have that configuration. But, um, and, and I will tell you, it's not just one person who's the angry grouch in the neighborhood who's complaining, generally speaking. And they've they have gone to the police repeatedly. Now, I will tell you that this is a low priority for the police on a Saturday night when there's a lot of other things going on in the community at 2 a.m. And so that's not going to get addressed right away. And if you're in a neighborhood where every single weekend you're awakened by the noise and the foul language, and quite frankly, I know for a fact of a couple of schools where um, a lot of fights broke out. They were corner schools that were visible to um, a lot of young adult males who didn't necessarily even come live in the neighborhood. I don't know where they came from, neither does anybody else, but the fact is is that it was an attraction because the it was um, available. And so the police were called on a regular basis and it still didn't put a stop to it. Now whether they were prosecuting these individuals or not for trespassing, I don't know. That I, I can't tell you. But quite frankly, a lot of times um, these things go to court and are slap on the wrist and it, it doesn't stop the problem from keeping on reoccurring. And the police department, do we really want them to be, when there's a more um, permanent solution for, the, for an ongoing um, situation and I quite frankly was approached by um, the police on several occasions to see if the school district could do something about it because they were being called on a regular basis so it, it's kind of like a, a, a shared responsibility at that point um, I understand what you're saying that it's not fair to the students most of the time we can find a location on the school property where we can still have rims up for those, um, for the students to be able to use during the summertime. That's not backing up to um, private property. Um, it, if that's a, a solution, um, we, c we can consider it. But uh, quite frankly, you know, the, the local parks also have had issues yeah. with, with um, and, and have had to consider, um, I sat in on, on one of the Recreation Commission's meetings where a whole neighborhood was up in arms with what was going on at their particular park during the summertime and the abuse of the, um, best, and they wanted those rooms taken down and something else offered because of, because of um, the abuse that was going on with the, the young adult males um, at night. So it's not just the school playgrounds that are, are seeing this kind of behavior. Uh, it's a tough subject and um, unfortunately uh, we're going to have to find a way to balance it, but it's not just one neighbor, generally speaking, who's having an There's issue. There's usually that one neighbor. Well, that's, and, that's you, a generalization that's really not President Petrikov, you keep saying that, you know, some of our, I can't think of one building that's not right in the middle of the neighborhood with his residence right there. I, almost all of our... But not all of, but not all of the um, basketball uh, rooms are located at the It doesn't have to be just basketball. Back. I mean, well, I'm talking about... Well, that's generally you know, what's, what's being used that we're talking about. So if the, if the city's having problems with the parks and, you know, we're having some problems with some of the, you know, the, the, the schools... What do we do? I mean, we need to we need to talk about that subject. I mean, we, we, you know, I remember growing up; uh, it was the best thing we ever had: the parks, the pools, the 
I was part of Dearborn. We used to have rec night, you know, three, three, two, two nights a week at Salina School and Saturday mornings. I, you know, those two days were just unbelievable. We keep talking about we want our kids away from their phones, away from the electronics. What, what options are we giving them? So uh, I think we, we, need to keep the, we need to keep this discussion. We can't solve things tonight. And we need right. to keep this it's discussion never going. It's the first. And, and right. Whatever it's policy. Right. Whatever. It's the last resort. It's always, always the, last the last resort. resort. And, and, and a, in the place that I did recommend it, there is a park one block down. Right. So it, it's not like it would be the first choice. It's a lot of complaints. And, and there is some danger with that if there's a lot of, if, there's, if the police are getting called and, and unable to do something, we can lock the gates. There's lots of, it's, it's, not a, it's not ever, it was nothing I would ever say as a first choice to do. But um, we are blessed in a city with lots of parks. I do know that the rec department has changed their courts to be half courts for very for similar that reasons. reasons. Yeah. So, um, but it, it would never be a first, first thing to come out of our mouth. It, it, it's a tough decision. It's a social issue in some regards to um, behavior. Uh, so, you know, but um, it's, it's not fair to penalize a neighborhood of individuals who have to, who can't move, who, who are there when, when there's another solution at that moment, which is unfortunately, it might be to remove a basketball rim and the children will have to find an alternate avenue, but it doesn't mean that it's completely taken away. And I'm not sure which school you're talking about that you have the concern it, with. It's not any particular school. I just think the policy needs to be equitable. How do we tell one of our constituents that you live in this part of town and this is the way we're gonna treat it, but on the other side of town, we're gonna to treat it completely different? I, I, I just don't think that's fair. There is no particular school. If you wanna talk about particular school, where my kids went to, my kids are almost 30 years old, so we're talking about over 20 years ago. Those basketball rims, first day in June, they go down. And I approached them, and so I said, I live around the corner, I can help, I can, you know, blah. didn't wanna hear it. No, I'm not talking to you particular schools, just in, just in general. What do, we, what do we tell, without mentioning neighbors, what do we tell those, those parents or the students or whatever that you chose an area that, I mean, we don't want to go there right now, but what do we tell them? That's not fair. That's all I'm saying, and we need to keep this, we need to find a solution. Mary. Yes, Trustee Thorpe. I know that I uh, got some calls last summer when school was out about vandalism at a couple of the elementary schools. Uh, are we continuing to add video surveillance on our buildings that could also possibly assist us when we have those instant instances? That's part of the um, bond work that we're doing right now. Okay. We're looking at additional cameras in the middle schools and some elementary schools if necessary. Thanks. Trustee McDonald. I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> I know in my neighborhood um, there are some, and particularly elderly folks, that like to walk to the track and use the track, and it's really good for them, and it keeps them spry. And there's one gentleman in particular that I talk to often. He was a World War II vet, so I mean, just to get him, and that's what he lives for, twice a day he does this. But I'm just curious, um, what are the hours? Are they not allowed to do that during school hours, or it's, as long as it's like not a group, during, if it's just individuals? During school hours, or? and specifically for school years. That's what I thought, okay. okay. And I think he's aware hours. of that, but I just wanted to make yeah. sure that people knew yeah. that. So as long as it's before or after school, yes. then it's open to the public or during the summer. My other question, well, it's more of a statement. Um, I have had, and I believe this particular um, issue has been taken care of, but I'm just thinking that it may go on in other buildings and uh, no one has informed um, the administration. Uh, it was an ongoing problem. It would be solved, and then it would come back and be solved for several years. Uh, there was a, um, a resident that the floodlights of the school, when they came on, they were aimed at her bedroom, and they were bright. And, and then they were directed again down, and then a, a few months later, again. So as far as I know, that situation has been uh, taken care of. I haven't talked to her a while, but she usually she lets me know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just want people to be aware in the buildings where those floodlights are, because they should be, I would assume, be mostly pointing down and maybe out a little bit, but not straight across in someone's bedroom. So just wanted to bring that to attention, because not everybody 
voices a complaint, and then they just think we're being bad neighbors. Right. So, President Pollock. Trustee Molson. Thank you. Um, I actually, I'm aware of that situation that you're talking about, President Peskoff, and I actually worked with that neighborhood uh, to <coughs> take one of the rims down, and that alleviated actually the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very unfortunate in that park, it's so close to the houses where these people would come with cars from outside the neighborhood and play at the park at night. And it's a city park, it's not a school park. Right. But I, I'd like one thing uh, at the same time that we're really, I'm really uh, pleased that you know our facilities are open to our community partners. I know I work with Dr. Maleko to get some of the soccer uh, teams that wanted to use Woodworth and other middle schools for soccer, and now they're paying for it, and they're happily using it. So it's a great resource for our community. Um, it's a delicate balance. I, I, one thing that I want to add, I think, on the City Relations Committee, that we still need the police to really enforce these kind of situations. If somebody is at the park past 10 p.m., they shouldn't be there. And uh, the police should be there, and they should be ticketed. I know at Morningside Park, they were just given, you know, a warning, go home, and they were not giving them, you know, the, the real consequences of your being ticketed, and uh, if, if that's going to happen moving forward, then probably they're not going to come to the park past 10 p.m., so I think uh, that we want to put that on the agenda for the yeah, it, it, it is a, it, tr trust me, because of my relationship with, I, right. it's been discussed many times because, uh, over the years, um, and I do continue to ask, because one of my questions still continues, and, and this is something I've complained about since the day we put the AstroTurf in, especially at Dearborn High, and, and uh, Dr. Ball knows how I feel about it, because <laughs> there is a Sunday group of uh, young gentlemen who jump the fence, it's padlocked, and use it to um, their uh, enjoyment. And it's a regularly attended um, activity there. And I, I used to go in the past with my ID and go up to the fence and say, do you have a permit? Because I see the padlock still on here. And they'll give, give me a look and then I'll say, you want to jump the fence or you want me to call the police? And they'll jump it. I said, you're welcome to play down here on the lower field. All you want to, but please don't go trespassing on the uh, fenced in portion. Now we're in the next phase of having to replace all the AstroTurf on all of our um, facilities again, and, but I know that this is still an issue. Um, and quite frankly, that's taxpayers' dollars too. And uh, I, I've had complaints from community members who say, I don't want my money being you know, used where it's, it's being abused and, and um, it's going towards this. I had somebody complain about the Woodworth fence. She lived right across the street from it and used to see everybody hop the fence all the time because of the turnstiles mm -hmm. and throw their bikes over to get onto the Woodworth track because they couldn't get it through on the fence. Um, and the fence was constantly being um, repaired because, because of the use. So it's not just Dearborn High that has this um, issue at times. So when we're talking about, you know, I, I understand wanting the facilities to be available to the community, but they also, we have to be responsible with the money that it takes to maintain them. Um, and sometimes people are ignoring the things we put in place to help protect the money that we've invested um, and just go ahead because they, they just feel they have that right. So are we going to, uh, boy, I'd like to, if I'm going to put some more money into that AstroTurf at Dearborn High, I'd like to at least make that one area of fencing a little higher at the same time, a okay. little, a little <laughs> tougher. Okay. I'm not going to say anything else, but <laughs> a little less accessible would be, would be kind of nice. Although my understanding is, is they do, they can, they're, I mean, we've had complaints about them with late night soccer games at, uh, Fortson at times and, and at Etzel as well. I mean, I guess they can climb just about anything if they're determined. It's just my two cents. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
just a, a notice to the board that we, you know, the calendar, the proposed calendar for next year has been in briefs and mm -hmm. uh, it'll be on the agenda next month for approval, which is what we usually do in June unless there's some comments. And take note, there is a Tuesday night meeting too. Because of the Because of. I think it's the spring break, yeah. It's, it's some yeah, holiday, yeah. 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 